Today's reading is from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, you are the least significant of Judah's forces, one who is to be a ruler in Israel on my behalf will come out from you. His origin is from remote times, from ancient days. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. The rest of his kin will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They will dwell secure because he will surely become great throughout the earth. He will become one of peace. The word of the Lord. season is moving to its close and for those of you who've been here to bear with me through the four weeks of the season you've heard three of my stories my story of hope my story of peace my story of joy and and here I'm preparing to tell you my story of love but I have found that as I prepared for this story my story of love was a moving target whereas my story of joy once it became obvious it was clear that was it this one has crept up on me and has changed. And I've wondered, is it this story or that story or this one? And it's not because I'm such a loving guy. <laughs> Those of you who are hearing me for the first time, don't let them fool you. It's not because I am such a loving guy or any better than the rest of us. But as I've realized, the idea of why we light the candle of love as we prepare in this last Sunday before Christmas has changed and has grown and evolved for me over time. I realize my story of love started almost 12 years ago. When I got up, I went into my morning routine, prepared my breakfast, and I pulled up my computer, and I was saddened. I was surprised by the news that I found as I went to, to read on the events that were going on in the world today. And then I was equally surprised by my reaction. But my story actually didn't begin 12 years ago. It actually began before that. It actually goes a long way back, but a good starting point for my story would probably be 9-11. That is the day that changed all of our lives in one way or another. It opened the door to re-understanding our own sense of who we are as a nation and our security as a country and, and it launched us into a series of wars that we find ourselves still fighting today. So in many ways my story began 17 years ago. But then it also began about 15 years ago when as part of the continuation of this story from 9-11 our nation entered into war in Iraq. And we began sending and deploying our military forces there for another excursion in the Middle East, another run through the deserts of Iraq. And this one, after previous attempts, this one was finally ending differently. Our forces were wildly, wildly successful in the early days of our campaign, quickly converging on the capital and then finding the ruler of our enemy, Saddam Hussein, going into hiding, we began the process of trying to mop up the last military resistance of the Iraqi armed forces and then hunt down the fugitives. The terrorists we were looking for, Saddam and his cabinet. So my story continued through these months that followed. 
And it picked up again then, not quite a year later, after the quick combat operations calmed down into counterinsurgency. And we found Saddam Hussein. Our forces found him hiding in a cave underneath a farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere near his old hometown. And he was arrested, brought forth and identified. And my story continued as we established a tribunal, an Iraqi-led and run tribunal, to try Saddam Hussein for war crimes, not committed during this fight, but war crimes he committed against his own population and in the wars with Iran back in the 80s. And I remember following these procedures. It took almost two years for this trial to play out. And the gamesmanship back and forth between the prosecutors and the tribunal and his defense attorneys constantly arguing at 90 degree angles across and away from each other. The prosecution and defense were something of a circus and just being able to clinically watch it was fascinating the way they would argue past one another. But the trial was taking place and I was, for one, was relieved that he had been captured and he was being brought to justice and would stand trial and have his day in court. We would see this through in a way that made sense to us as a people, as Americans. And so after two years, when the guilty verdict was reached, I was not unhappy, I was not dissatisfied. I felt that the trial had been conducted, strange though it was, and he had been found guilty. And I awaited then what we in this country would know to be a long process of appeals. Anytime a person is sentenced to death, the appellate process takes time. And as well it should. I struggle with whether, as a person of faith, as a follower of Jesus, we should be the ones as humans to wield the power of life and death. I struggle with the question if we are not usurping from God that which does not belong to us. But even beyond those struggles, I take some solace in the fact that we do not exercise that power to take life lightly. We don't do it quickly. We take our time and we appeal it automatically and we appeal it again so that we do not commit murder and sentence one to death who should not be killed for their crimes. So as Saddam Hussein's trial came to a close, I expected at least another two years of appeals and wrangling and the circus of arguments that made no sense and talked past each other. And the appeals process began. And it didn't take anywhere near as long as I thought. And in the appeal, the initial sentence was upheld. And so I thought, okay, surely there'll be another appeal. And then on December 30th, 2006, I awoke. I prepared my breakfast. I walked in, turned on the computer, and I pulled up the news. And the headline at the top of the newspaper website was that Saddam Hussein had been executed overnight in our time. He had been hanged to death. The trial, the sentencing, it was done. I was surprised. I expected this to be longer. I didn't expect that his sentence would be overturned, but I expected it would not be handed down so quickly and carried out with such speed. And as surprised as I was by the news, I was equally surprised by my own reaction. I began to tear up. Not because I felt that he may have been undeserving. Not necessarily out of my own struggles with whether capital punishment is something as a Christian that I can support and stand behind. But I felt that he deserved better. He deserved a full appeals process. He deserved the chance to be truly heard, not, not the quick and dirty appeal that he got one time. And I found myself struggling, not only with my emotions, but why I would feel this. I had no love for an evil dictator. I have no love for a man who will use chemical weapons against his own people, much less against his enemies. I have no love for a man who will rob from the poorest of his citizenry so that he can live in wealth and splendor, who will execute those who disagree with him, who will lock you up for speaking ill of his name. I have no love for any person who would do that. And yet, 
I found myself so moved at the news of his execution that I couldn't control myself any longer. I did not know what to make of that at the time this happened. I have spent years trying to figure out what I should make of that. And I still wonder if I know what to make of that moment. The only answer that I can give is that in that moment, when I express sorrow for somebody that I would otherwise declare unlovable, I must have felt and experienced a touch of the love God feels. Because I know God can love those that I cannot. I know God will love those that I cannot. And I have struggled to figure out, is this an experience that I need to replicate? Is it an experience I can replicate? How do I find the ability to love as God is loved, human though I am? And I continue to wrangle with this question, not just about that incident. I found myself heading off to seminary just a couple years before that with the understanding in my mind that at least one of my family members, completely different direction, one of my family members was probably gay. And I had lived in a world where the only message I had heard was, as a Christian, you can't accept that. And that God won't accept that. And yet, I knew my family member. I loved them. And they loved me. And there was nothing wrong with this person that I had known so well. So I went to seminary going, how do I balance this? I don't think there's anything wrong with my family member, but the faith message I keep hearing is that there is, and that I shouldn't be able to care, and I shouldn't be able to love. My journey through seminary has allowed me to move on that position, and has allowed me to love in the way that I think God loves, even if only in brief moments. For I have been able to find peace with more than just one member in my family who is gay. I've been able to find hope and acceptance. And I'm still not there yet. There are still people I struggle to love. And yet, I not only know, I trust, I have to trust, that God can love them even when I struggle to do it. For years, I have stood before congregations on the final Sunday before Christmas. And I have shared a message of God's love for us. It has taken me years to realize God isn't just loving us for our own sake. God is loving us to invite us to love in that way too. It ain't easy. If it were easy, I wouldn't be standing here talking about it. If it were easy, you wouldn't have need to overpay me with that check that I got earlier. <laughs> if it were simple, we wouldn't need to be reminded. We wouldn't need to prepare. We wouldn't need to celebrate Christ's coming because we'd know he was already here. But we struggle to love because it's hard. I struggle to love because it's hard. I'm going to continue to struggle to love. And my struggle will be to embrace love and not my own, not my own ideas, my own definitions. To try to embrace love and to do it in the way that God would love. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. I don't know whether that's comforting. I don't know whether that gives you pause. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. But I'm going to trust that God walks with me as I try. That's my story of love. I suspect many of you have your own stories as well. I suspect some of them may be just as difficult for you as this one has been for me. Maybe there's an opportunity to talk about it. I know I'd love to hear it. Maybe there's an opportunity to share. Maybe we need to continue to reflect, continue to pray. Whatever it is, I challenge you. I pray that you will consider your story of love and see where God takes you. I can tell you I've ended up in places I never expected to be. I imagine you will too. Amen?
Amen.